always good to be with you. Welcome back. Great to be here. Thank you so much. So I'm going to bring up Bank of America uh, because their uh, numbers coming in higher uh, than expected here, but also because their CEO is saying that the latest spending and savings data shows the U.S. consumer is quite healthy. Thoughts on this? I mean, surprised? No, I'm not. I, I also have the benefit of tear sheets from 56 private companies. We've seen no slowdown yet. A highly unusual situation going on here, given uh, how much the market is corrected, anticipating slowdown in earnings and a recession and a Fed gone wild with another 75 and potentially another 75 after that. None of these rate hikes have affected the consumer yet. And I speculate it's for one singular reason. No economy has ever printed $6.72 trillion in 30 months. That's basically turning on the printing presses, printing money, giving it away for free, dreaming up other reasons to give more money away for free, such as student loan forgiveness. And then the Anti-Inflation Act, that's just hilarious to call it that. Uh, it's very inflationary. And so at some point, we'll have to stop printing money, but it hasn't happened yet. All-time record deficit. Um, consumers flush with cash, and these earnings are proving it out this week. If we're going to get a slowdown in earnings, it's probably going to be in Q1 or 2 next year because it doesn't look like it's going to make it this quarter. And uh, as a result, we've got a really perplexing, difficult time for investors. It, it is a perplexing time. And you say, you know, higher rates aren't affecting the consumer yet. But what about inflation fears? I mean, hotter numbers just keep rolling in here. When does that hit the system? Well, the inflation fears come from the CPI number. Uh, which was over 8%, and that is inflationary. However, there's a new narrative going on in the market with investors regarding how the CPI is constructed. 40% is in shelter, and shelter stats are notoriously long dated. In other words, the numbers you're seeing now reflect the, the shelter market, the housing market, the apartment rental market 18 months ago when it was smoking hot. That is not the case in major cities now. Rent increases have slowed down, housing prices have softened as mortgages have increased, and yet it's not reflected yet. So it's a little bit of saying, I wanna change the data set now because I don't believe it anymore. That's kind of one narrative. But even though it's sitting at over 8%, the market is willing to fribulate, waiting for more earnings um, validation that we actually have a slowdown. It's simply not there yet. And so if the Fed keeps using this 8% number and keeps ratcheting rates, they will overshoot. Yeah, I want to I get your observations on this. I brought this up on my last, um, my last uh, interview, that I'm just you know, fresh back from Rome, where the city was completely sold out. I mean, I've been there thousands of times, and I've never seen it like this. You know, every hotel sold out, restaurants sold out. You can't get a hold of luxury goods. Lines around the corner. Same situation here in New York. You can't get a brunch reservation, hotel sold out. Just everything is packed. I'm sure you would agree from, from your travels. Uh, so then, does a rude and cold awakening affect us overnight? Is it just going to hit us like a wall at one point, like boom, recession? I don't think so. Um, I, I agree with you. I have another index, Las Vegas, which I've never seen it fuller than it was last week at the Web3 conference. You couldn't walk in the aisles. It was so jam-packed. Casinos jam-packed, restaurants jam-packed, traffic jam-packed. So that, that pent-up demand is certainly there. Recessions start traditionally with a rise in unemployment. Haven't seen that yet either. If you're in the food services industries on either coast, where in California, for example, the minimum wage is $15, you can't even hire people for $23 an hour now. They don't even want to work. So that, that cash that's flushing around the system still having an effect there. It's not clear how the, you know, the poo-poo hits the fan on this one yet, but the market has made a decision. The corrections in the S&P 500 have been brutal and fast in every single sector. And so the market, generally speaking, is never wrong forever. And what it anticipates is a sharp decline in earnings, because right now the PE, if we believe the earnings for next year, is sitting between 14.5 and 15%. Well, that's getting close to a bottom. I mean, you could argue the bottom would be 12x, which is really, really low earnings for the S&P. But here we are at 15. I mean, I'd argue it's time to start nibbling. You can't guess the bottom, but my goodness, just on a strong index basis, you could go into this market saying to yourself, regardless what the correction is, two-thirds of it's baked in. Well, then, 
you know, I, I, from what I'm hearing from you, are you somewhere to, in the middle of, you know, Jamie Dimon, who's saying recession coming six to eight months, brace for economic hurricane, and, and President Joe Biden on the other side of the spectrum saying uh, recession unlikely, and if one does hit, it will be for short term. Are you somewhere in between there? Well, Biden has to talk his book because he's only weeks away from a midterm where he's threatened right now to lose the House. Nobody knows what's going to happen in the Senate. What they wanted to have happen was that there's some indication of a slowdown in inflation. They didn't get that. And their gas prices in some states are on the rise. That's never, ever good for the incumbent, regardless of what party they're in. Inflation really kills you at midterms, and that's what they've got. So also, if the Fed raises another 75 basis points, before, which they will do before the midterms, that's not helpful either. So it's a really difficult act that he has to, a higher wire act he's got to do. Biden's got to talk his book and try and keep as many of his candidates in the, in the game as they can. Um, you know, when we talk about politics, abortion was the issue, uh, and that seems to have been shifting now in the last few weeks to inflation and the cost of protein like chicken and food goods and gasoline back in the fray again. So, you know, these things are binary. They're very difficult to call, but it does matter to you as an investor what happens in the midterms. There's no question about that. Well, let's talk about that. You know, the November 8th uh, date uh, creeping up here, as you mentioned, Republicans considered favorites uh, to win control of the upper chamber of Congress here. Uh, what kind of a shakeup should investors be bracing for? Well, in the polls, and all, all of us buy services that are investing to get this data every day, they're about six seats ahead. I'm, I've learned in the past that means nothing. There's no guarantees on anything. But right now that would be the House. You can't call the Senate. So let's say the House flipped. The good news on that is all new bills, all new initiatives that are not bipartisan bills, in other words, ram a jam -a down your throat bills like the student debt thing, uh, ram -a jam -a bill like uh, anti-inflation bill. I mean, nobody wanted to vote for that on the other side of the aisle. So those kinds of bills are dead for the rest of this presidency. There'll be total, total gridlock. And that is a good thing. Uh, the markets love gridlock. Markets like a pause that refreshes. We need a pause. The printing presses have gone insane and that's why we have inflation in the first place. I mean, for all the talk about inflation, you print $6.72 trillion in 30 months. What, what the hell did you think was gonna happen? <laughs> of course there's gonna be inflation. And, and to add to that, add fuel to the inflation fire, let's talk about oil and the rocky Saudi-U.S. Uh, relationship. Uh, your take on that, uh, Kevin, it seems that you know Saudi-U.S. factor here has hit rock bottom. Yep, uh, you're right. That's a uh, difficult challenge for Biden. I don't think anybody's gonna give him A plus for foreign affairs at this point. Been a lot of mixed signals. We started with the green initiative in the U.S. Uh, we gave up our oil independence that blew up in everybody's face in the form of high gasoline prices. Now he's talking to uh, dictators in Venezuela, flying over to see the Saudis, asking them not to stop production. They don't care. It's obvious. Um, that's not great. But at the same time, it does make us do a little soul searching in the U.S. about getting back to energy in independence. And there's a lot of pressure on that, given what's going on in Germany. So all of this ends up being a market consideration. Right now, oil is being capped in price by those bears that are concerned about a global recession and use of, of energy. But not every country is buoyant with the consumer as the U.S. is because the U.S. dollars cause lots of headaches in other currencies. You know, when you look at the value of currencies in, in other nations against the U.S., it's getting very, very tough for them. And so there's a lot of cross currents here, but right now people are focused on the Fed, they're focused on the midterms, and all of this is going to play out in the next five weeks. So stay tuned. It's going to get really interesting.